for the differences as well. That is perfectly fine. Some of the important differences between ancient times and modern times when it comes to mortality uh, and infectious disease. We live in a world where uh, the mortality transition has, for the most part, liberated people in the developed world from the day-to-day -day fear of death by infectious disease. So we die of chronic degenerative organ diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, but by and large, not by infectious diseases. Whereas in the ancient world, most people most of the time died of infectious disease. And as I'll talk about, uh, the death rate was highly volatile. We live in a world where we have modern um, enlightenment science. We understand the microbiological causes of infectious disease. Um, this, of course, has allowed a rapid biomedical response, particularly in the development of uh, a number of safe and effective vaccines. Uh, and of course, our experience of the pandemic is uh, more globally interconnected. The way we perceive and communicate the pandemic uh, due to social networks is radically different from what existed uh, in antiquity. But with all those differences, I still think we can, as scholars, approach the question of ancient plagues recognizing that the collective experience of a pandemic does shape our perceptions. I think it can, in fact, help us by deepening our understanding uh, of what it's like to live through a pandemic. And some of the most powerful phenomena that I think are most likely to last uh, in our perceptions of the pandemic are things like um, being separated from friends and family, particularly during sickness and death, disruptions to ordinary rituals of burial, um, the extreme social mistrust, and very unequal social ramifications. So those are sort of uh, the, the phenomena that, that we may perceive and experience in a pandemic. And I, I think that can sensitize us to read ancient texts differently. So plagues are, oops. Plagues are everywhere in classical antiquity from beginning to end. It only takes about 10 lines uh, in ancient literature to get to the first plague. Uh, and they're there right to the other end. If you take Procopius or something in late antiquity um, to, to be the other end of classical antiquity, uh, plagues are there from, from one end to the other. And I'm gonna talk about Procopius a little bit, but particularly the, the plague that he's describing there, which as he said, just darn near killed all of the people, um, which is maybe a little exaggerated, but nonetheless um, is an important plague. But almost continuously in between, whether it's historiography, Thucydides to Livy, uh, or poetry from Sophocles to Lucretius. Um, plagues are sort of everywhere in classical antiquity. Um, the language of plagues in antiquity is rich. It can encompass words that just mean sickness, words that mean death or mass death, words that mean mass dying from a kind of sickness or even almost shading into disaster. It's important to remember that they didn't have germ theory in antiquity. So there's no sense of plagues being caused by specific uh, microbiological agents. Whereas we, of course, know that we're living through a plague that's caused by a specific virus, SARS-CoV-2. I want to start also by pointing out a very important point about the English language, which is that the word plague in English is itself very ambiguous. It has really two different meanings. One is generic. It means an epidemic, a disease outbreak, a pestilence without respect to the underlying microbiological cause. So a plague is simply a mass death due to a sickness. Uh, and we also mean plague in English in a more specific sense to identify disease outbreaks caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. So the plague in the sense of the specific disease um, whose most notable clinical course is bubonic plague. So plague can be simply a disease outbreak. I'll talk about that. Plague can also be an outbreak of disease caused by this particular uh, microbe that's particularly important in history. And I'm actually gonna end up talking mostly about uh, plagues caused by Y. pestis and particularly a series of, of diseases caused in later antiquity uh, by this particular germ. So to overview, I'll start by talking about what is an epidemic. So what's a plague in the generic sense? Uh, and here, uh, I'm, a, I'm a classical historian, but uh, will argue that um, in any uh, try attempt to understand the experience of plagues in antiquity, uh, we can learn a lot by trying to understand the basic biological dynamics of infectious disease and disease outbreaks. Then I'm going to give a very quick look uh, at a broad swath of Roman history, uh, including a series of really notable pandemics, uh, highlighting some of the problems and challenges we face uh, as historians of those disease outbreaks, before really zooming in on um, what I think is the biggest of the ancient disease outbreaks, I think is certainly the one that we are learning the most about right now uh, that could change. Um, but 
is also one where there's still some major open questions. And I'll talk about some ongoing um, work that, that I'm involved in um, that hopefully will help put some uh, additional pieces of that puzzle together. So starting with the, the biological basics, what is an epidemic? Uh, the CDC defines it as an increase, often sudden, in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in that population in that area. So epidemic sounds like a sciencey term. It has, you know, classical roots. Uh, it's Greek. It's used by epidemiologists. Uh, it's a very rough and ready term. There are no quantitative parameters around this. So uh, an epidemic is just an increase, kind of sudden, of a disease. Um, it's a rough and ready, handy way of thinking about patterns of morbidity and mortality. Uh, it takes two to tango. And it takes two things to have uh, an outbreak. You need a pathogen and you need a population. This means that outbreaks of disease epidemics uh, have a biological dimension that involve the microbe that's responsible in some diseases that are transmitted by intermediate vectors like mosquitoes or ticks. Um, it can involve vectors. It can also involve the biology of the, the host. The human host, per, for instance, may or may not have had prior exposure uh, that can grant immunity, which plays a major role uh, in the dynamics of an infectious disease outbreak. So there are these really fundamentally biological dimensions. And then there are these very important social dimensions. So to have an epidemic, a microbe has to spread through a population causing sickness and death. Uh, and that will be shaped by a number of really fundamentally social factors, the health status, so the level of poverty, nutrition, uh, well-being, equality in a society, uh, as well as other social factors like war or famine. So in the ancient world, uh, where you have agricultural societies living relatively close to the subsistence level, uh, famine is an important trigger for infectious disease outbreaks, but also things like war, migration, anything that can cause sudden disorder in a society can make a society more susceptible to an epidemic. Epidemic. Epidemics are caused by microbes. Microbes come in different biological categories, like viruses. We're all familiar with SARS-CoV-2, but viruses cause diseases like AIDS and yellow fever. Bacteria that cause diseases uh, like plague, cholera, tuberculosis, uh, shigellosis, and so on. Protozoa, single-celled organisms that cause uh, diseases like malaria. And helminths or worms that cause uh, a range of important infectious diseases in humans. I'll return to something I started to describe on the very first slide, which is that every pre-industrial society is a high mortality society. Uh, before 1900, even in the US and UK, which were uh, at the front edge of the health transition, most people, most of the time, die of infectious disease. Um, there's no, it's, it's a difficult question to estimate, but probably like two thirds to three fourths of people um, die of infectious disease. This means that the crude death rate is high. Usually I'll show something in a second, usually probably around 30 uh, per thousand per year. So about 3% of the population dies every year in a society like existed in the classical Mediterranean and life expectancy at birth of zero uh, is low. We don't know what life expectancy at birth was in the Roman empire because we don't have the kind of government documents that we have in modern times, but a range of estimates that usually place it somewhere in the, the low to mid twenties. Um, and it can't have been much outside of that range. So it's a much lower life expectancy at birth because uh, infectious diseases are the predominant uh, cause of death. In any society where infectious diseases account for most mortality, there's going to be a strong amount of variation. So we're also used to relatively smooth uh, mortality uh, experience in that um, seasonal mortality in current times is very low, uh, and interannual variations in mortality uh, are also very low. But that's not the case for the kinds of societies like those of the ancient world. There's a lot of variation, even within the year. Uh, here you see a chart uh, of the seasonal mortality in fourth century Rome. I spent a whole summer of my life building this chart. That's all I have to show for it. Um, so I hope you like it half as much as I do. Um, it shows that even within different age brackets, um, the seasonal pattern of mortality in ancient Rome varied. Young people um, died very um, steeply in the late summer, early autumn, whereas actually, as you would expect, um, the older uh, population tended to die more in winter of respiratory diseases. This is actually a pretty common um, pattern and kind of validates this data. But the, the death rate moves within the year, and the death rate moves between years. We as 
people interested in historical demography would love nothing more than a really good long-term data set for how much the death rate moved in ancient Rome. We, of course, have absolutely nothing like that. I think uh, one of the best things we can do to start to create a mental picture is to use data from early modern times, so before the the control of infectious disease and lengthening of lifespans, but from a time period where we do have a range of really, really rich documentary records, whether they be government civic registrations or things like um, parish registers that provide annual records of births, burials, and baptisms. This allows us to do things like what you see here, uh, an estimation of the crude death rate in Northern Italy. So the kind of healthier part of Italy. And this, I'll come back to this, but note the time period. 1650 is significant because this actually is after the last big outbreak of bubonic plague in northern Italy. So this is actually a time period when the death rate has actually already started to smooth, when the volatility has been um, dampened by sort of limited control of infectious disease. And look at the, ignore the smoother line, that's just a 10-year moving average. The jagged line is what's interesting. The death rate moves a lot. There are bad years, there are healthy years. Um, the healthiest years, even so, are still only about um, 25 per thousand per year. So that means about 2.5% of the population is dying, even in a really um, healthy year. But the point here is that when you have infectious diseases, um, you're going to have a lot of volatility in the death rate. So given that variation is sort of always there, what does it mean when ancient sources describe an increase in death as a plague? What makes a plague a plague and not just sort of a ordinary bad year? I think that's a really, really hard question. I don't think there's a single um, unifying answer to that uh, in the way that our ancient texts use languages, use language. Reports of plague in ancient texts are very sensitive to perceptual and cultural framings. But I would also insist um, that there is always an underlying reality and biological experience. Um, whether those connect or are accurate is a different question. But what I'm really interested in today uh, is the, the reality and biological experience of ancient populations. And I think that even for those of us who may be more interested purely in the kind of cultural artifacts, um, say you're interested in whatever, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, uh, it's helpful to have some sense of the possibilities of what may have been happening um, in the plague of Athens to read those cultural artifacts. But what I'm really interested in, uh, I admit, is the, the experience of ancient populations. Were some epidemics a bigger deal than others in these realistic terms? Uh, I think comparatively, absolutely. Given what we know from late pre-industrial times, it would be pretty astonishing if the ancient world didn't have uh, a fairly volatile, rocky, bumpy uh, experience of the mortality rate because of infectious diseases. So that means I think one of the challenges for ancient historians interested in this is to find ways to sort of wrap our hands around when and where and why and how were the kind of bigger uh, events. And so a lot of what I've worked on have been uh, three pandemic events, very different in shape, that stand out to me against the whole of the written record. So from the late Republican period through the really early medieval period uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, which is the period that I, I sort of um, have spent the most time on personally looking for evidence of pestilence and epidemics, um, the record is very uneven. It's almost certainly um, not reliable in many, many different ways, but I still don't think that that makes it um, useless or meaningless. And in fact, one pattern that is to me significant is that in a fairly well-documented period uh, of Roman history, say from the first century BC down to the outbreak of uh, a major plague in the 160s, this is a period of Roman history where we know quite a lot. If there was a huge pandemic that killed a massive part of the population, you could at least um, have some reason for thinking we would know about it. And there's no evidence for it. In fact, there's really not much evidence for anything more than kind of really regionalized um, epidemic outbreaks. Then all of a sudden in the 160s, you have uh, a wide range of evidence for a massive disease outbreak, the evidence for which is uh, probably an order of magnitude greater than the evidence we have for every disease and health event for the preceding two centuries. So um, that in itself suggests something to me, it suggests that there's some kind of underlying important biological significance to this disease outbreak. So um, to me, the three that stand out are the Antonine Plague that erupts, as I said, in the 160s. We don't actually know exactly when it ends. Uh, it may have had one or two waves. 
We have no idea what the, the biological agent of it was. The most commonly suspected agent is the smallpox virus. That can't be right in any simple sense. There may be some more complicated senses. I'd be happy to talk about that if that interests people. Um, the, the extent and impact of the Antonine Plague is, of course, uh, debated. Then you have several decades without any clear attestation of major disease outbreaks before again in the 250s. Uh, I may have dated this a year or two too early, it turns out, but the, in the 250s, there's a significant amount of evidence from a really poorly documented generation in Roman history where a lot of times, you know, there's, there's a person, we don't even know if he was an emperor or not. I mean, this is a, a very dark period uh, in Roman history. And yet there are uh, seven surviving eyewitness testimonies to the plague of Cyprian and a number of secondary sources um, that are lost primary text. So uh, it just stands out in the record. Then again, you have a long period without a whole lot of evidence for really major disease outbreaks. The fourth century is the period of Roman history that I know best. It's probably the single greatest, richest documented period of all of classical antiquity, just the, the density of source material uh, for the history of the fourth century um, outweighs for the rest of <laughs> antiquity. Um, and there's no pandemics. Uh, there's, we would know if there were some huge disease outbreak that struck from Antioch to Rome in 350, uh, we would have many people telling us about it and we just don't find it. So um, there are times at which the, the absence of evidence makes you start to suspect that um, there really weren't um, always disease outbreaks of this magnitude. That pattern holds down into the sixth century um, when most notably um, the Mediterranean experiences what is called the Justinianic plague. Uh, I wanna make a, a terminological note here. Um, the Justinianic plague is what I refer to as the first outbreak of a what will be more than two centuries, a series of outbreaks of what, and I'll mention this too, we now know is the plague caused by Yersinia pestis um, that appears in the Mediterranean in the 540s. So the Justinianic plague is what we should call the first wave of outbreak in the 540s. And the broader two centuries of outbreaks, we should call the first plague pandemic. Um, there's some um, terminological inconsistency in different people who work on this, but I don't think it makes any sense to call um, an outbreak in, say, the Carolingian period of the 8th century, the Justinianic plague, um, since he'd been dead a long, long time, uh, whereas we can call this the first plague pandemic, and in many ways it mirrors the second plague pandemic that I'll talk about in a minute. So what I want to do uh, is mostly focus on the Justinianic plague, but let me say why I think these stand out. In the record, as I've said, you have clustering of literary evidence and literary evidence itself, although um, we can we can argue about uh, what it means and how valuable it is, I would tend to be on the side that even if we use it critically, uh, it can provide us quite meaningful testimony to the experience of pandemic mortality. But what's interesting about these episodes is that it's not just the literary sources. We have documentary evidence, generally in the form of inscriptions. The papyri are almost frustratingly useless. Um, for the history of, of health and disease um, of the kind that I'm interested in. Uh, but the inscriptional evidence, for some reason, has been more yielding. Um, people marshal proxy evidence from Richard Junk and Jones, sort of seminal studies in the 90s using things like uh, building inscriptions to argue for the significance of the Antonine Plague to more cutting edge proxies like uh, Andrew Wilson's group that's using Greenland ice cores to track the, the output of uh, pollution from smelting in Roman mines in Iberia um, and shows a really significant drop in the later second century. So people marshal all kinds of really interesting proxy evidence, um, which is vulnerable to kind of post hoc arguments that just because there's um, a, a correlation, a pattern doesn't mean that there's a causal relationship, but um, it's certainly suggestive. This is similar in the archaeology where often these episodes of, of putative population change or reflected in changing patterns of settlement or uh, exchange. And then I think all have um, significant uh, reflections in the history of money and labor. And so for me as an economic historian, that's one of the things that differentiates kind of background low-level volatility in the death rate from what I like to call mortality shocks that are more systemically important, that they tend to affect things like um, the monetary system uh, and particularly the, the labor supply. So they can have an effect on wages um, that really has to uh, reflect some underlying population process that's different from these sort of low-level variations that are pretty common. But there's still enormous challenges that surround 
our interpretation and ongoing study of all of these um, ancient Roman pandemics. And to me, it's exciting that uh, I think that for various reasons, the rise of genetic evidence, more people doing environmental history, um, the experience of climate change and COVID-19 in our own world. Um, there's lots of uh, interest in these topics. The book that I published in 2017, um, The Fate of Rome, um, brings together what I think of as kind of a first synthesis. Um, and already there's been a lot of work done in the last four or five years. And hopefully um, that'll mean there needs to be a heavily revised second edition um, a few years down the road. But this is an area where there's a lot of uh, interest uh, at present. And I think that's a great thing. Um, there are enormous questions about what causes um, these bigger outbreaks. Is the climate system involved? Um, that's something where even a few years ago, I think we have trouble really knowing about the, the deep connections between climate and disease outbreaks. That's still a very complicated question. Are there economic causes, Malthusian overpopulation? Is it more fundamentally biological, evolutionary? That to me is sort of the, the theory that I'm putting forward uh, in the book and one that I would still be inclined uh, mostly to stick by. Uh, and I actually think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has well illustrated that, that, um, that the inner society differences in the experience of COVID-19 have been very profoundly affected by culture, wealth, equality, politics. Um, but there's so much commonality because what caused the COVID-19 pandemic in some really fundamental sense is SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the emergence, the evolutionary emergence of new pathogens can be a very destabilizing force um, in human societies. So uh, great debates about how to conceptualize what causes these pandemics, really endless debates about how big they were. And I think this is um, going to be a kind of essentially contestable um, question for as long as we're doing ancient history, because we're never going to have um, the kind of documentary evidence that we have from uh, more modern times. Uh, and so we're all trying to get at um, what's a really, really fundamentally hard question, um, starting with really how big were these things, meaning what was the level of morbidity and mortality? And then what were the second order effects? What wider impacts to society, economy, um, even culture, religious change, um, changes in belief and attitude um, that followed in the wake of, uh, of these biological events. So I want to then zoom in a little bit on the first plague pandemic um, and talk about some answers and some ongoing questions. And um, this is the, the disease outbreak that starts with the plague of Justinian and lasts for over two centuries uh, down into the uh, eighth century. Um, we now know, thanks to archaeogenetic evidence, that Yersinia pestis, the bacterium you see there on the, the bottom right, um, is the, the biological agent of this pandemic. That was suspected from the written sources that described the clinical symptoms of the disease, but it's always very challenging and ultimately uncertain to do what we call retrospective diagnosis, to take uh, a description of a disease by an ancient author who had a very different cultural frame and to be able to really, really know uh, what the microbiological agent of a plague was. Now we don't have to wonder uh, because the DNA of the pathogen itself has been in multiple cases by multiple labs extracted from um, skeletal remains. So from the um, dental cavity of skeletons of putative plague victims um, using high throughput genome sequencers that allow the reconstruction of genomes from tiny little fragments of DNA that have you know, been dead for 1500 years. It's really uh, a marvelous achievement that also for us allows uh, certainty in knowing the biological agent of some of these outbreaks. So we have positive archaeogenetic identification of the plague of Justinian and several of the subsequent outbreaks that make up the first plague pandemic. I think among the many reasons why this DNA confirmation is important is that it, again, it encourages something that we were already inclined to do, which is compare with the second plague pandemic. This is the outbreak that, uh, at least in the Mediterranean, begins with the Black Death in the 1340s and uh, continues uh, for over three centuries in Western Europe and longer elsewhere uh, that was caused by the same biological agent again, in the context of a pre-industrial society. There are differences uh, in the case of the second plague pandemic, and particularly the rise of quarantine and public health interventions that help to stymie um, the, the transmission of the disease that for the most part, we don't see uh, in late antiquity. Um, and 
white pest, as, as I'll say, is in a league of its own. So uh, against, uh, of all the human pathogens, there's something about this one that's simply extraordinary. And as somebody who's uh, worked on the history of disease broadly, um, to me, this is a huge challenge. It's one of the hardest diseases um, to wrap your mind around and the kind of damage that it did is simply uh, mind boggling. And so I'm gonna zoom in uh, on some issues in the first plague pandemic and particularly um, in Italy and particularly looking at the first plague pandemic as, as a whole. This is a, a kind of focus of my current work is also to um, try and get us out of just thinking about the plague of Justinian. I think the plague of Justinian was catastrophic uh, and was an enormous outbreak in the 540s. It rightly draws our attention, but I actually think it can also mislead us into thinking of the, the disease event as a kind of one-off. We know that wasn't the case with the Black Death. The Black Death is probably the worst biological disaster in human history, but it was just the beginning of the second plague pandemic, a period of several centuries when the disease recurs um, for reasons that I'll talk about in just a minute. So one of the things that I'm really interested in now is trying to think about the first plague pandemic broadly uh, and to think of it more regionally um, in the, the context of Italy. Let me start with just a couple of sort of biological basics about plague, because plague is a really strange disease. It has two features that really uh, start to account for why it's um, so distinct and also so distinctly deadly. One is that it's a truly zoonotic disease. So it's an animal disease uh, and always remains an animal disease. Most infectious diseases that we think about, whether we're talking about tuberculosis or malaria, um, have some kind of origin, but then adapt to human hosts and are able to transmit sustainably within human populations. Plague can be transmitted directly between humans, but not sustainably and not for long. It always retreats back to its animal reservoirs and its animal reservoirs seem largely, if not exclusively, to be um, social rodents like marmots, uh, gerbils, gerboas, um, social rodents that tend to live uh, in burrows. So the plague is really an animal disease that uh, has to get into human populations. And when it does, um, from an evolutionary perspective, it really doesn't care about us. We're not its, its sort of sustaining host. It is also a vector-borne disease. So it is transmitted by flea bite. Um, that's not the only way that it transmits, but uh, we now know that the plague bacterium is very good. Uh, it's evolved adaptations that make it uh, very efficient at transmitting by flea bite. So it's a vector-borne disease, and a lot of vector-borne diseases are particularly nasty uh, because unlike, say, respiratory diseases where they have a lot of struggles to get into your uh, body, to get past your mucous membranes, um, vector-borne diseases get sort of assisted entry directly into to sterile and vulnerable tissue. So it's a vector-borne disease. It is also one of the most ecologically complex diseases, and uh, we still don't fully understand the nature of the historical epidemiology, but uh, I think we can talk about a classic model is that somehow the plague gets from its uh, reservoir hosts like marmots uh, via fleas to uh, an intermediate host like the black rat. And these commensal rodents that are um, so important in human history and that uh, are omnipresent in um, ancient urban settlements by the time of late antiquity um, are an important intermediate host. And in some senses, the human outbreak is very likely really uh, a, black rack, a black, black rat panzootic um, that burns through all of the rat populations, and then, again, by a flea bite, uh, jumps to human populations. It can transmit directly between humans, either directly um, through um, aerosol transmission in the form of pneumonic plague, and potentially through um, human ectoparasites like lice, although that seems to be um, less efficient. <clears throat> Plague is a terrible disease um, that takes different courses uh, in the host's body. The bubonic um, course of infection happens when the bacteria migrate to a nearby lymph node, usually in the neck, neck armpits, um, groin, or knees, and swell, multiply, and swell into a hard ball um, that ancient sources call buboes, hence bubonic plague. Uh, it can also just um, enter the bloodstream and multiply rapidly, overwhelming the body's immune response, causing septicemic plague, um, which is simply rapid form uh, of of, of multiplication in the uh, blood that leads to very quick death, and then pneumonic plague when the plague bacteria, either um, through respiratory uh, transmission or um, inside the body, enter the lungs uh, and multiply in the lungs and is almost uniformly fatal. We know that plague is really in a league of its own, and from a time period when we have much better um, documents, 
um, we can at least see the, the crude outlines of how that was so. So here we have um, the number of burials in London um, and look at the 17th century when the plague was still occasionally around. You can see the um, giant peaks. Um, every one of those giant peaks is caused by plague. Those are the plague years. You see the big one um, is the famous plague year um, with, with the um, Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year. Uh, and then after that, plague doesn't come back to London um, and the mortality variation um, dampens. This is also the case um, over long periods of time in Italy. So the dots are um, Locascio, Elia Locascio and Paolo Malanima's um, reconstruction of the population of Italy um, from the late Middle Ages to the onset of modern growth. Um, and you can see the impact of the Black Death um, and the, the powerful impact that plague has. Um, a couple of notes about this. You can see from these kind of big picture, um, big pictures of demography that demography is very dynamic. Um, so the course of Italy in the late Middle Ages and early modern times is a story of change. Um, is a change in which really, um, you know, nobody likes monocausal explanations, but um, there's really no doubting what the number one long-term factor in the demographic trajectory of Italy is. When plague is really, really severe and recurrent and becomes pervasive in the countryside, um, lots and lots of people die and the population goes down. Um, in the 16th century, when the plague sort of recedes a little bit, um, the population of Italy grows. In the early 17th century, there are huge plague outbreaks, the population goes down again. Uh, and then um, once the plague is controlled, the population starts to grow again. So um, the Black Death, in other words, isn't just a one-off. It may have been uh, a singular disease outbreak, but it's really the beginning of a long period in which the plague is present but variable. Um, and I also like to point this out for my um, friends in late antiquity, um, now particularly that I'm studying Italy, where everybody, I mean, this is like the, the most entrenched um, conventional argument that all the bad stuff that happens in Italy in the mid sixth century uh, is because of the Byzantine Gothic Wars. Uh, I think that's preposterous on comparative grounds. Uh, in the 16th century, Italy is ground zero for the military revolution. So the rise of mass gunpowder armies, um, the French invade um, with forces that are much bigger than, um, say, the armies that Belisarius and Narses um, are attacking the, the Goths with. Um, and remember when the Byzantines or late Romans attack the um, Goths, they're running around poking people, um, not shooting people. There's just no way that like a battle of um, like Busta Galorum, which is 10,000, 15,000 um, on either side, running around trying to, to cut each other with knives um, is really why um, it gets so hard to find people in Italy in the later sixth century. I find that um, highly unsatisfying. But the, the kind of entrenched um, story is that the Byzantine Gothic Wars just ruined um, Italy. And certainly they did some damage, but uh, there's no way they had the kind of demographic effect that's often ascribed to them. The plague shows up in the Mediterranean in the year 541. Um, one of the ways in which the plague's DNA is helping us piece together parts of the puzzle we didn't know is that the lineages that cause the Justinianic plague find their closest relatives today in Central Asia, in the highland regions around Lake Issyk-Kul, um, in Kyrgyzstan, where Kazakhstan and Western China meet. Um, and this is, uh, we can infer very likely the geographical region, which is the origin of the strains that cause the Justinianic plague. So one of the really interesting open questions right now that I won't go into, but where we really don't totally understand is when and how does the plague get from Central Asia to Pelusium in Egypt on the shores of the Mediterranean, right across um, from uh, the Gulf of Suez. So it's a hinge of trade with the Red Sea. So the plague seems to enter um, the Mediterranean very likely from the Red Sea, but we don't really have the pieces of its itinerary. What we do tend to have are very dramatic descriptions of the arrival of the plague in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and particularly in Constantinople, which is then, of course, the seat of Roman power, uh, wealth, culture, patronage, um, and unsurprisingly, um, the only region for which we have um, very detailed eyewitness accounts. In particular, we have two lengthy eyewitness descriptions, remarkably by very, very different people. Um, one, a Syriac churchman who viewed the world in apocalyptic terms, John of Ephesus. The other, in a very different language and mode of perception, uh, by Procopius, who's writing a classicizing uh, history of the wars of Justinian. 
even as fundamentally different as their cultural frames uh, were. Um, they describe, I'm not going to read this, but they describe uh, uh, an outbreak in lurid terms that actually have a, a lot in common and describe the breakdown basically of the, the city's ability um, to keep up with uh, the burial of the dead and describe in very parallel terms Justinian's uh, efforts to, to control the situation, his appointment um, of one of his uh, officials to try and uh, ultimately ferry bodies um, over the, the sea uh, out of Constantinople. One of the big advances just in the last couple of years has come from the identification of the DNA of the pathogen in sites where we simply have no evidence. So to me, one of probably the biggest question about the impact of the Justinianic plague was, was it really bad outside of big cities in the Eastern Mediterranean? You can find ways to doubt Procopius and John of Ephesus. I think you have to work really hard um, to, to say that the plague wasn't pretty catastrophic in places like Constantinople. But what about villages? What about Western Europe? Um, the source record is terrible in most of these places. For Italy, we only have one chronicle source that tells us what's going on in the 540s. It says there was a great mortality, but what do you make of that? Well, this is one reason why archaeological DNA is so important. Marcel Keller, who's um, now a postdoc in Tartu, comes out of Johannes Krauss's lab at the Max Planck Institute, um, was the lead author on a remarkable study that identified the plague's DNA um, at a, a eight new sites, um, all in Western Europe, most of them tiny villages. So like Edix Hill in Cambridgeshire is a hamlet of 100 to 150 people. Um, and the plague has now been identified in numerous specimens from a place that is a tiny settlement way off the main roads. Uh, and it doesn't prove, but it allows, certainly encourages the inference that if the plague was there, um, that it was able to reach other places like that. The demographic impact of the, the first wave, much less subsequent waves, is debated for an updated state of the question. Peter Saris just published um, a good article in Past and Present. Um, people who minimize the, the significance of the plague tend to try and downplay the importance of the primary sources because the primary sources say that the plague was a big deal um, and accuse people of using them uncritically. Sometimes we'll argue that the proxy series don't map to the rhythms of the plague, um, say that the literary sources include few, if any, references to long-term um, consequences, um, and say that you can't really infer the presence of plague um, if it's not positively attested. And so even the ancient DNA evidence really only tells us that plague was in those um, 10 villages in the West. Um, so Mordecai and Eisenberg in a series of papers, including a big one in PNAS in 2019, um, argue, um, make all of these arguments, arguments um, and ultimately say that the, the plague of Justinian, we should think of as sort of like a seasonal flu outbreak. I think that's helpful for arguments purposes. I don't think it's convincing. Um, people like Peter Saris and others um, try and use the sources critically, collectively, and to bring in the ancient DNA. Peter has a great line in his um, paper that um, it's really kind of obtuse to, to say that um, the finding of ancient DNA at Eden Hill only tells us that the plague reached there. Um, if we found an extraterrestrial buried in sixth century strata in England, no one would say it's only one alien. You would have to assume that uh, others came with it. So um, the really the debate is so far sort of focused on the, the plague of Justinian. Uh, there's been far less attention played paid to recurrent outbreaks that happen over the course of two centuries. So we need to ask questions like, where was the plague hiding? How many outbreaks were there? Were they big? Probably some of them were, probably some of them weren't. Um, I've been working on even mapping in time and space. So this is looking at results of, of a new study of mine for the Italy data. The others come from Stephacopoulos and the Keller paper. Um, but in Italy, um, I think we're only even beginning to, to map the, the rhythms of the plague's outbreak. For instance, as you can see, there's very few outbreaks attested in the seventh century. And it's a really open question to me if that's a, a meaningful pattern or if it's simply a kind of, um, was the plague bad in seventh century Italy or was it not around for a while? I think both of those are, are truly possible. Um, some of the evidence for some of these outbreaks is limited, but still pretty good. I'm gonna look at that one in 565 uh, because I think 
we can move the debate forward in a variety of ways, continuing to get DNA evidence, also looking at the distribution of animal bones, looking closely at changes in archaeological settlement, like has been done recently uh, by Baraz and Fuchs and um, Israeli archaeologists looking at the Negev, where there's a major change um, in the 540s, which um, is potentially linked to the outbreak of plague. Of course, I believe in using comparative evidence, particularly if you're studying Italy, looking at late medieval and early modern Italy. But there's still a really a ton of work to be done just looking at the sources and seeing what they say. And even though I'm advocating interdisciplinary work, uh, I would emphasize that I think the DNA evidence actually makes the use of critical philological tools to read the sources um, just as or even more important. For a demonstration of that, Mike McCormick just published uh, a recent paper in Speculum looking at one source, Gregory of Tours, very important source for the sixth century, um, and sort of reads him very, very carefully for what he has to tell us about plague. And what's clear is that for Gregory, plague is a big, big deal, but also he only sort of knows his little corner of the world um, and barely knows anything unless it's sort of happening at Rome um, uh, beyond his little piece of, of the world. So um, it, it's a great example of how to continue to, to squeeze um, very familiar texts for all that they can tell us. Um, I have a paper coming out um, because it's the humanities, not the sciences. Um, this paper will come out in 2023 um, uh, that looks at the written evidence for Italy. And particularly, uh, I'm looking at evidence that's filtered through um, our most important source for this period of Italian history, Paul the Deacon, who is an eighth century um, noble Lombard who becomes a monk and writes a history uh, of the Lombards that is our single most important um, source for uh, this period in Italian history. We know a lot about how Paul used his sources because sometimes we have them, like Gregory the Great, Gregory of Tours. Sometimes we know he was using a source, like Secundus of Trent, who's a chronicler that I'll talk about in a second. And what we can say from when Paul's using sources that we have is that um, he's kind of plagiarizing, that the, the exact words um, are often still there. If you put it through turnitin.com, um, it would tell you that, that Paul was uh, relying a little heavily on his source material. Um, in this case, the outbreak to the later sixth century, we know that he's using a source that is lost to us, um, written by uh, a historian named Secundus of Trent, who lives in Northern Italy um, and uh, who wrote a book that Paul tells us he had. Um, and Paul seems to know a lot about Northern Italy in the late sixth century. And it's significant that he tells us um, in very uh, great detail about an outbreak in 565. Um, for absolutely no good reason, this outbreak has been misdated by everyone. Um, so you may sometimes see it attributed to 571. Uh, but it's in fact uh, in 565 when a very great pestilence broke out in the province of Liguria. This is not the modern regione. This is all of the western half of northern Italy. It was preceded by um, kinds of signs um, that indicated that the plague was going to come. Actually, I think this is a very difficult um, passage to, to interpret, but some kind of forewarning or causal um, signal that the plague would arrive and a year later it comes. He describes the disease and it's very clearly bubonic plague. We don't yet have any DNA evidence um, sampled from Italy, uh, but this uh, description is compelling enough that we can be fairly certain that what happened in Northern Italy in 565 was an outbreak of bubonic plague. And according to Paul transmitting his uh, eyewitness account, uh, it was uh, a, a devastating mortality event that had high levels of death as well as social dislocation um, that left um, the places kind of um, silent. It's a very evocative um, description. And also describes the, the kind of social phenomenology uh, of living through a crisis mortality event and describes um, people being separated from their loved ones uh, during sickness and death, disruptions to burial practices, uh, as well as economic uh, effects. So it's, a, it's an account that we can, uh, I think, having lived through COVID-19, um, read more empathetically. And he certainly ascribes major consequences to the plague. In fact, it's clear from the, the tiny little pieces that we do have that Paul's source, Secundus, in a sense, attributed the Lombard takeover of Italy, which did proceed without major pitched battles, um, as happening uh, in the aftermath of the plague, and in some sense, uh, being facilitated by the plague. He says the Romans no longer had the power, the virtus, 
um, to resist the um, Lombard invasions because of the plague that had happened under Narses. So um, this is uh, a very clear example of a source describing a disease outbreak that we can be fairly certain was caused by a particular microbe that we know is capable of causing um, serious morbidity, mortality, uh, and social effects, and here describes the whole sequence of causation. Still, I think it poses huge challenges. What do you do when you have one single written source? It's the only one we have um, described plague in Italy in the 560s. Um, we're clearly only going to be able to move forward um, oops, by um, combining these kinds of local sources with also more global regional work that's looking for patterns, and by continuing to advance interdisciplinary study um, with archaeology and archaeogenetics that may ultimately deepen our sense of the importance of the pandemic in uh, Italy and more broadly the Mediterranean at the end of antiquity. And I think we are um, now more urgently uh, in need of, of revisiting the history of infectious disease and the very uh, long chronicle of social responses to crisis mortality um, that resonates with us with us in our own times. Thank you very much. And I look forward to questions. Please tell me I wasn't on mute that whole time or something. <laughs> OK, OK, uh, there you are. It was fine. Um, OK, let's let's see. Um, any immediate you'll, questions? You'll moderate questions. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. OK. And if you prefer to, a, 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 to ask them in chat, I'll look at those. Paul? Hey, thank you very much, Kyle. That was really fascinating. And I definitely appreciate the comparative big history approach. Um, I have two very different questions. The first is uh, there's a passage from John of Ephesus's uh, ecclesiastical history, which is sort of burned in my mind because it was the first week after the first pandemic lockdown and it was the first Zoom talk that I gave uh, and I, uh, I used it to, to start. It's about monks and their experience uh, during, I guess it was the first outbreak in the 540s. They were, uh, John of Ephesus reports how from village to village, they were blamed for the coming of the plague mm. uh, and they were thought to be demonic and the kids would run away from them. Uh, and I was kind of uh, fascinated about that for a different reason, but I'm wondering if you can kind of contextualize that, if there's any evidence for uh, this sort of uh, scapegoating uh, of particular social groups more broadly, because it, it seemed pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting to me that it was the the poor monks who were blamed. Wow, no, that's fascinating, and I I really haven't um, grappled with that uh, in any depth, but I but I will. It's certainly a broad phenomenon that humans um, human societies in times of crisis and particularly times of of epidemic mortality tend to to scapegoat um, and. You know, we've living through COVID nineteen have a up close and personal um, experience of that, namely, but not exclusively, anti Asian um, discrimination that that's been stoked by COVID nineteen. It's I also think it's an important pattern. I mean, it, this goes straight back through the Black Death and anti Semitism. Um, Jews are widely blamed in in Europe for. Uh, the Black Death. So there's there's kind of a common pattern of uh, of human societies um, sort of scapegoating. But I also would say there's also a common pattern of those um, episodes of scapegoating activating underlying forms of prejudice and tension. So you know anti Asian discrimination didn't start with COVID nineteen, but the pandemic kind of energizes it. Um, and amplifies it, gives it oxygen. Same with anti-Semitism in Black Death. So, be a question for you. But um, you know, one of the interesting questions we might ask of a text like John of Ephesus is, what if monks are being blamed? What pre-existing tension um, is getting amplified by? 
And it'd be interesting too, because, you know, we might not always, so many of our sources are transmitted um, by the church, whether, you know, clerical or monastic sources, but um, maybe they're reading out some of the tensions that we can, we can actually see activated more clearly um, in these times of crisis. Um, so I, I would want to read it through that lens, um, but, but there's a really common deep pattern of, of scapegoating and activating forms of, of prejudice in pandemics. Thank you. Get a second question though, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, switching gears a little bit. Uh, and again, thinking of a kind of uh, long durée comparative approach, uh, you, you showed the uh, John of Ephesus and Procopius and their kind of account of what happened uh, in Constantinople and Pelusium. But uh, are there for later periods, uh, in uh, Arabic sources or Sanskrit or Chinese, similar accounts of uh, epidemic outbreaks or, or, or pandemics. And it would be interesting to, to see uh, commonalities which might go or which probably do go beyond the level of a literary trope uh, by opening up that kind of uh, comparative approach. Yeah. I mean, um, well, there's a, there's a lot to that question. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One is that um, the there's still, I just feel like there's, we're just getting started um, in the yeah. study of the first pandemic. And, you know, there's, for instance, there's really just one really good paper on John of Ephesus. Um, like we need people with the, the expertise in Syriac and sensibility for biological and social history. Um, to really dive in and do those works. I'll point out that the, the passage that I'm, I was showing quickly at the end there, but I just like to put it on people's radar from Paul the Deacon is certainly from the sixth century, it's one of the three or four lengthiest plague narratives. And nobody's ever looked at it closely. Um, so I, I have this paper coming out now, but, um, but you know, I think that's why there's some, there's some, uh, punch behind the, the accusation that we need more critical reading of the sources. I totally agree with that. Um, now, I think when you do that, I don't come away with, from reading of that long passage of Paul the Deacon and thinking that this is just convention. Um, it is full of cultural references and intertextual conversation, but we wouldn't expect otherwise, um, right? Everybody who writes about plagues in Greek is knows of Thucydides. Um, it's so over the top that it becomes a joke, even in antiquity, that everybody's just copying Thucydides. But, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not useful. It just means you have to come to the text with that critical awareness. Sure. So, you know, John, uh, Paul the Deacon is, yes, he's referring to Virgil. That doesn't mean that, that his text is sort of epic poetry. It just means that in the repertoire of things he knew how to say, the way to say that something was really, really sad and awful was to pull from Virgil. Um, so all that to say, we're really just getting going. There are um, sources in other languages too. There are a huge number of Arabic sources once you get to the, the seventh and early eighth century that still need a lot of work. Uh, Lawrence Comrade's Princeton dissertation from whatever it is, 91, um, is still the only treatment of a lot of these texts. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to be done China gets into a whole other series of questions, but we desperately need um, good published work by um, scholars with the requisite control of the, the languages to, to tell us if uh, whether anything was going on in parallel in China. That's also kind of an open question at the moment. But I think getting at these different traditions will, will reveal that there are some commonalities and we'll have to tease out are these commonalities of experience or are they kind of a cultural the shared cultural realm, because there is a shared cultural realm. I mean, one of the, to give an example, I'll stop. The sort of question, can you run away from a plague? It becomes this really interesting stylized religious question that shows up in every language and including Islamic discourse in Arabic. And it's in Greek, Christian, Latin Christian discourse. So there's some kind of shared even across the the linguistic spectrum yeah cultural repertoire of ways to talk about plague 
thank you very much. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask a question. Um, do you, have you seen anything significant uh, uh, trying to make any connection between the 536 event and the, uh, the evolution of the first plague? Yeah, so um, very quickly to describe what you're talking about. Um, we have in the ancient literary sources, and again, from China, to um, Ireland, literary sources say the sun disappeared for a really long time, a uh, year and almost a year and a half in 536, 537. Um, we also now have very good ice core data and dendrochronological data to reconstruct the history of volcanic eruptions and the history of short-term climate change. And um, so it's now, very clearly established that there was a northern hemispheric vol volcano of pretty significant magnitude in 536 that is putatively what causes the the solar dimming um this of course would have well come back to it we also now know what we didn't know from the written record is that there was an even bigger explosion five years later a tropical volcano um and we also now know that something about this doubling this combination of boom boom two really big volcanic eruptions produces um, an effect on the climate that is non-linear so it causes really really dramatic cooling so that the 540s are the coolest the coldest decade in the late holocene so from the last 2500 years in a synthesis of different tree ring data this looks to be as cold as any other moment. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and it leads you to suspect that surely there's some relationship between the climate event and the disease outbreak. So you have a kind of once a millennium scale climate anomaly followed almost immediately, five years later, by a you know, once a millennium scale biological event. So it, it would seem to unusual or unexpected if there were no connection. The problem is we don't really have good models of what the mechanism of the connection was. Did it cause famine and starvation that rendered populations hungry and biologically susceptible? I mean, it probably did that, but I don't think that explains um, why the plague all of a sudden shows up um, and does the damage that it does. Does it cause some kind of movement in either the reservoir or uh, intermediate host? So the, the wild rodents or the commensal black rats? Uh, probably, I think that's probably where the link is to be found. Um, but we don't really understand what the mechanism is. Did it cause people to starve and then to migrate? Uh, are there some kind of subsistence migrations of desperate people um, that cause transmission or contact um, or cause the disease to get out of its, its reservoir and show up? Um, it's, a, it's a conundrum. We don't really know. I mean, I think we'll, we'll, you'll probably see attention to that um, and arguments, and maybe we'll get a better sense of what the, the likeliest links are. But right now, um, I'd say we don't. We don't have a very any consensus or even any really really well worked out models of how they're related, but it just seems crazy um, to have, you know, you, you have a bang and then you see some smoke. You kind of assume they're connected, but we, we actually don't know what the what the real link is. Yeah, I'm I'm told there's even a 547 event. So there's another <laughs> volcano. Yeah, there's another <laughs> volcano in the 540s. They I mean, they cannot buy a break. Um yeah. So whatever whatever Justinian um did, he uh he made the powers to <laughs> be pretty angry. Any other questions? Well, if there, oh, Deb, 
I was interested from an archaeological perspective, I suppose. You gave us quite a bit of information, um, dental analysis, for example, and textual analysis. I wonder where do you see this going in the future or what kind of studies do you think would be like ideal? You were mentioning yeah. like, we need to do more studies, but like yeah. if there's one thing that you're like, we need a student to develop this and it would be life changing. Yeah, well, I can I can tell you um, because I'm I'm thinking and scheming about this right now. But the um, I think a lot of the the early work so far has just sort of been what can we get a hold of and can we see if our machines and and computational tools are good enough um, and and it's great and it's been absolutely revolutionary already. Um, but what you don't have really are studies where the design um, from sampling to, to testing are really worked out in conjunction with historians who probably bring to the table knowledge of the social and economic uh, possibilities, archaeologists who can really bring to the table archaeological data sets and, and questions and nuance. Um, and archaeogeneticists who have the, the tools to, to bring really refined analysis to the DNA. So I think you, you need to get study designs that, that bring teams across those fields together where there's a kind of more comprehensive sampling effort to, to get at the right kinds of settlements, the right kinds of strata, um, and ultimately in conjunction with the written evidence and the archaeological evidence, archaeological evidence, the whole thing from, you know, human artifacts to, to animal bones and looking for when and where there are changes or not. Um, and, and then bringing the DNA to that because the DNA still has more to tell us than just the plague was here and the plague was specifically in this kind of settlement and not in this kind of settlement. That's important and it's always gonna be a little bit tricky, but the, the genomes that are recovered are going to provide information about the course of the pandemic. So the the different outbreaks um, of the even the first pandemic, we can already tell from some of the limited sampling that different outbreaks have very very slightly different genomes. So you can see the evolution of the the Yersinia pestis bacterium. This will be a way to trace to date and to spatially map um, outbreaks. So like for Italy, we'd love to know, are the strains that are there related to strains in Gaul or are they related to strains in the East? There's about to be more samples published, including some from the East. Um, is, does it look like there's a local reservoir? Does it look like these plagues are connected or not connected? Do we see the you know out plague in the seventh century? So. I think even with the, the archaeogenetics, as exciting as it is, we're about to get beyond just sort of what can be done into how do we design um, bigger studies that, that bring different kinds of expertise into the design. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is really fascinating. And I totally feel your pain on the, I've spent years on this, and this is the little graph that I oh, have I to it. show for it. Oh, I got it. Totally oh, on I with it. you. I, yeah. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Catherine, please go ahead. Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, your answer to that last question made me think, given that there are so many sort of expertises required to make this um, a fruitful area of study and to make it really meaningful, I wonder what you do to teach this material. I think it's got such potential for drawing students from a variety of backgrounds into, into uh, classics, um, but because it is so complex, it's also perhaps difficult to start with in maybe like a freshman or sophomore level class. I wonder, yeah, do you have any favorite learning activities or ways to approach teaching this holistically uh, to your undergrads? You know, I really haven't um, taught it a lot just because of uh, the teaching assignments I've had, which is unfortunate. But, um, but you know, to me, what, what seems to work are things like team teaching, um, because you, you can bring different expertise and all the energy that that brings. But also, um, I'm sure it's the same um, at Iowa as it is here. Our department, we have a big humanities degree but a ton of our students are pre-med. Um, a lot of them are double majors um, and they've got their, you know, their have to major because they have to be microbiology majors because their parents want them to 
do something that's going to go to med school. Um, and they have their passion major, which is usually classics or letters. Um, so you have all of these students who actually know more than I do uh, about, um, you know, organic chemistry. And um, it can be a really fun way to, to learn um, by bringing some of these topics in. So I haven't got to teach like a class um, that I'd really like to on Plague, but of course I bring it into to classrooms and find that um, it's exciting. My students often know um, things that I don't. And so, so just say that there's, there's so many of those um, pre-med humanities students out there. And this is, I think, a great way to, I think it brings energy and enrollments to the humanities, um, but it's a great thing for us to, to pitch to, to really, really smart students who might not otherwise minor or major. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, uh, we'll just thank you so much, Professor Harper, for your excellent presentation thank, that thank is so all. fascinating. And uh, we hope that we can have you visit us live soon. All right. So, it sounds, sounds like a plan. Thank, thank you, you all. You, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you all.